When we're at our worst, what does it take for us to forgive ourselves and forge a better path forward? And is this a possibility even from a place like death row? I kick off season three of Humans Now and Then with a conversation with Tessie Castillo, author of Crimson Letters, Voices from Death Row, along with one of her co-authors, Aleem, who joins our conversation from North Carolina's Central Prison Death Row. You know, ultimately, is I had to look within myself and, and be honest with myself and, and recognize the reasons and the motives that I did things and, you know, not be deceptive, first of all, with me. And once I was able to take account for those things is that I could work on changing uh, the things that I didn't like about myself. But as long as I evaded or eluded whatever those um, things that I didn't like, whether if it was motives of greed or hatred or anger, as long as I eluded them and didn't accept them or, or confront them head on, is that they continue to, to have a hold on me. Tessie Castillo wrote Crimson Letters, Voices from Death Row, along with four men who are serving death sentences in North Carolina, whom she met while volunteering at North Carolina's Central Prison in 2014. One of these men, Michael J. Braxton, known as Aleem, has been a death row inmate at North Carolina's Central Prison for almost 30 years, sentenced to death after the murder of a fellow inmate while serving a sentence for a previous murder. He has since taken accountability for his actions, has found his faith, and advocates for innocent prisoners on death row. So, ready to learn more about how a death row inmate can move from suffering to accountability and working to make a difference? Let's discuss. I'm Rebecca Scott, and this is Humans Now and Then. Tessie Castillo, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. You bet. So your story is inspiring and the work you did on the Crimson Letters book is uh, pretty impactful. It left me a little speechless. I would love for you to share a little bit more about your background and what inspired you to pursue this very important project. Sure. Uh, So I do have a background in criminal justice reform. I've worked for about 10 years, especially around drug policy reform and trying to change some of the laws that we have around drug use and how many people we put into prison for drugs. But the death penalty was not something that was really on my radar. Well, what happened was I was at a Super Bowl party one year, randomly. I don't even like uh, football, (laughs) but I was there and kind of hanging out near the food by myself. And I happened to run into a gentleman who was a psychologist who worked at Central Prison, very close to where I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. And specifically, he worked with men on death row. And he was trying to bring classes, rehabilitative classes, into the prison for the first time because nothing had ever been offered to people on death row in terms of trying to help them think about their lives or or, uh, make amends or grow as people. So he was trying to bring in classes, and I volunteered to teach a writing class. So I started teaching about a year later after I went through the volunteer process and was really blown away with what I saw there. When I walked into the prison for the first time, I was teaching about 20 guys. They all wear these blood red jumpsuits to symbolize what they're on death row for. And I was immediately struck by the level of humility that I found in the men uh, who I was teaching. And through the journaling class, I was encouraging them to write about their pasts and how they got to death row and then also how they may have changed or grown since they had been there. Most of them had been there at least 10 years, if not 20 or even 30. Mm. And I was so moved by the levels of remorse and wisdom that I saw that I wrote a letter to a local newspaper advocating for the humanity of people on death row and, and challenging the assumptions that we have about people convicted of murder. And about a week after that letter was published, I received a very terse uh, notification from the uh, warden of the prison, notifying me that my services were no longer required. My class was canceled. Mm. So after that, I started corresponding with several of my students, just writing to them. And over the years, they just sent me these letters about the human condition and about the capacity of people to change and to transform even under really inhumane and degrading circumstances like those in prison. And so I suggested that we put together a book and that was what Crimson Letters became. 
Wow. I think that's such a powerful story around accountability as well. Because a lot of us hear the narrative that folks that are convicted of crimes usually are denying the crime. And we see that story over and over, whether it be on Dateline or you know other stories out in the world, that we have this perception that people who commit these types of crimes don't mess up or don't take accountability for those crimes. But that definitely is not the experience that you've seen from these folks that are actually thinking very deeply about the impact of their crimes and also trying to do things to make a difference with the time they have left even though they're on death row and have been there for some time. So what is one of the most impactful differences that you've seen from the point at which you started working with these gentlemen on death row to the point they're at today where they've really grown so much in their experiences and in their life? Sure. So when I started teaching these men, they had almost no contact with the outside world. At that time, this was 2014 when I went into the prison. They'd never had any classes until that year to help them with thinking about things or growing. They had no access to any internet or computer. They had no access to phones. They were only allowed one 10 minute phone call per year on death row. So they were almost completely isolated and they didn't seem to feel like they had anything valuable to say or that anyone would listen to someone like them. And now, since we published Crimson Letters, we've been doing speaking engagements across the country. We've been on NPR. We've talked on some really big podcasts. We call into universities now and into churches. And we do hour or two hour presentations where my co-authors call in like they're going to do today and speak to the audience and answer questions about justice and humanity and transformation and remorse and growth. And for them to be heard like that and to have their opinions valued and to be considered an an expert on these issues is shocking, (laughs) I think, and really transformative to realize how much they have to contribute even from where they are. Yeah. And I think it's one of the things that I say often is there's a difference between who we are and the things that we do. And we can always change how we behave in the future, the things we do moving forward. We can't always change what's happened in the past. What is the one of the things that you feel that folks outside of that world, obviously very few people on death row in comparison to the population, for some people out in the audience that's maybe listening now, this might be their first exposure to what the inside of death row might look like or feel like. What is one of the things that folks outside can learn from these men that would impact their lives for the better? I think you can learn about suffering. Each of these men, what they all have in common is that Leading up to their time on death row, they all went through really intense suffering in their lives. And they also all caused really intense suffering in their lives. And then as they've continued in prison, that suffering has also continued. The environment of prison and the way that they're degraded and dehumanized is really atrocious. And many of them have broken under that system. The system is designed, I think, to break the human spirit. And I definitely saw that from many men in prison who just seemed to have given up. They didn't value themselves. They didn't think that they were capable of changing or doing better. And so they didn't really do much in terms of growth. But others, and I would even say the majority of the people who were in my class, had actually taken that suffering and they used it as an opportunity to grow from it and to make amends. And they used that time that they have, which is really their most valuable commodity in prison. And instead of wasting it, they used it to reflect and to become better people. And there's a lot more of that that happens in prison than we think about on the outside. There's a lot of people who have used that suffering and that time as a gift. I even have co-authors who say that they're happier now than they've ever been, even before prison just because they understand themselves so much more and they're more forgiving of themselves for who they are and and understanding of their failures. Yeah, that's pretty powerful stuff. I think there's a lot of people who have done much less in the past, but hold on to those failures or those mistakes that they've made and allow it to define them. So being able to overcome our biggest mistakes in our lives and be able to come better and and learn from that is something that's really inspiring and probably something unexpected that, that again, people in the outside world might not expect to hear from, you know, men on death row that have committed terrible crimes. So we're lucky enough to hear from Aleem in a moment. Aleem is one of your co-authors, so he's going to be calling in a minute. I'm looking forward to being able to speak to him as well. But before he joins us, 
you at an opportunity to say, Tessa, you have the ability to make one significant change in the criminal justice system, what would that change be? I would do away with the prison system as we know it altogether. I think there are some people who are very dangerous and they should be away from society. But we have more than two and a half million people in prison in the United States, and that is far more than is necessary. So I think we need to develop alternatives to dealing with people who may have mental health issues, to dealing with people who may struggle with drug addiction, to dealing with people who are involved in very petty crimes, who probably wouldn't be involved in those if they had more economic opportunities. So I just think we could take the majority, vast majority of the people in prison and offer them non-prison alternatives and they would flourish. So there's just too many people there. That's what I would change. They don't need to be there. Mm, right. This is Aline calling now, actually. Okay. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Good. Uh, we have Rebecca on the phone. Can you hear us, Aline? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing? Good morning, hey. Aline. Aline, I'm Rebecca. It's very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. So I asked Tessie a few general questions to frame the book and the project that you have been working on. Um, I've got some questions for you as well. Is there anything, before I get started with the questions for you, I wanted to check if there's anything specific on your mind today that you'd like to discuss? No, not really. Um, I was just doing a little bit of work on some music before I came over and called, so my mind is pretty fresh. Fantastic. So we know, of course, you, a little bit of your background being on death row for about 30 years. I'd be interested to know beyond just how other folks might think of you as a death row inmate, how would you define yourself? Well, I uh, consider myself a reformed prisoner. I am also the former imam or the spiritual leader for the Muslims here on death row. And I also am a writer and an MC. Fantastic. You know, if you look back to who you were, 30 years ago to who you are today. What's the biggest difference that you see in yourself as just Aleem as an individual in the world? Oh, absolutely. My faith. Um, I became Muslim and really started practicing Islam in 2010. And it's just been the practice and the application of my belief that has, you know, had the most profound effects on my, you know, not only my state of mind, but my, my attitude and my code of ethics and my behavior. That's awesome. So you also mentioned that you work with music. So music is also an important part of your life. How has that made a big difference in your experience in prison? Well, music's always been a huge part of my life. Um, you know, I've been a hip hop, you know, head, as we call it, since I was probably about eight. And all, a lot of, most of my memories are just connected with music throughout growing up in life. And it's the one consistent that has always been with me, whether on this side of the wall or on the other side, is that it's something that I loved doing before I came to prison. And I still have the ability as far as writing. And it was through writing, particularly working with my, my rhymes um, years ago when I was especially going through a lot of emotional and uh, psychological trauma that I was able to use writing my rhymes and focusing on the creative expression of a lot of the emotional pain that I had that gave me a can do it, gave me a vent, an uh, opportunity to vent and express myself. And I continue to do so. Yeah, that really does make a big difference. I've, I've spoken to other artists in the past that talk about how that really raises not even just their experience in the world, but their ability to make a difference. And I'm curious to know, based on what you have learned about yourself and about your behaviors, like you mentioned, you found your faith, you've been able to work on music to help spread positive messages or really think about the difference you can make. What's one thing you would like to do to make a difference in this world? Well, my objective in my faith in Islam is that if you take a life, that it's like taking all of humanity's life, it's killing all people. And if to save a life, it's like saving all of humanity. So my focus, my goal, my aspirations are centered around trying to advocate on behalf of people that are innocent here in death row. Um, I came to death row in 2004 physically. I was on death row since 1997, sentenced to die, but I was in solitary confinement 
all the way until 2004. So when I got to the actual physical death row, the unit here, is it was several years of being in this environment and meeting people and just having my, I guess, my preconceived notions blown about what I was, you know, thought I was going to expect an encounter here on death row. So when I actually met people who were innocent, in particular Henry McCullum, who prior to him being released in 2014, is that I honestly didn't believe that he was innocent. And, you know, when he was released and proven innocent and, you know, given a pardon of, of innocence by the governor, is that it just blew my mind. It blew my preconceived notions of, you know, the people that were around me. And, and it changed my perspective on life. And I just knew from then is that I felt that I had a, a moral responsibility, a moral duty to try to help people in here that were actually innocent because, you know, this is one of the most cruel punishments that a person can experience and they haven't committed a crime. So that's that's what I'm really focusing on. Right. That's definitely a very impactful and powerful mission that you have to help those folks that have faced consequences for crimes they didn't commit. So I think a lot of people, like I mentioned to Tessie before, you were able to join the call. A lot of folks, they're probably my listeners out there, people out in the world, don't understand what the experience is inside death row. They probably have a lot of preconceived notions about what you might experience on a day-to-day basis. What's one thing you would like folks to know about your experience on death row? Well, um, you know, it is a definitely very difficult process, and def- difficult to experience. Um, you know, being sentenced to die is, you know, definitely traumatic psychologically. Um, one of the things that, you know, I encountered that I didn't really expect is that I didn't really have a lot of knowledge about the legal process. So when I was sentenced to die, they gave me an execution date. I still remember it. It's February the 8th, 1998. And I didn't have any legal representatives right after being sentenced to death and I know that I had a great amount of fear and I didn't really know what to expect, what was going to happen. I knew I had heard prior that you had an automatic appeal, but I didn't hear my lawyer in the courtroom saying we want the appeal. And I know that the judge had gave me a date for February the 8th, 1998. And when I got here is that they had an execution in January of 1998, and it was actually the last um, execution that we had in North Carolina by gas chamber, and it was terrifying. They ended up cutting the gas chamber out as an option after that because they said that some of the gas may have leaked from outside of the chamber, and they had to evacuate uh, the witnesses and, um, you know, everyone from that area. And so just seeing that experience and watching the um the guards and the administration and the staff, um, how they interacted during the execution night, it was very horrific. It was it was terrifying, and you know I had I thought that I had an impending date coming within weeks after that execution, and so that was you know one of the most traumatic experiences that I faced since I've been on death row. Yeah, I can't even imagine. One of the things that I think is really inspiring about your story is your ability to take accountability for your actions. And so I think that there's a lot of folks that have a perception that people who commit these types of crimes don't take accountability for what they've done. And what we start to learn through Crimson Letters and through stories like yours is that's not necessarily the case for many people, not even just in death row, but in the prison system, that they do take accountability for the mistakes that they've made. And they do take actions to try to improve their presence in the world or make a difference in positive ways. So what would you say to anyone um, out in the world who may struggle with taking accountability for their actions? What would that mean to you? Yeah, I think, you know, really the only way that you can really, you know, um, grow and, you know, um, get to a point where you can seriously ask forgiveness from the creator or to even try to find any place of forgiveness within yourself is that you have to first, acknowledge what you've done. That was one of the first things is, you know, whenever some type of tragedy occurs is that a lot of times we we, we tend to be in denial is that we don't want to accept what actually happened. 
And so, you know, the trauma, the shock, et cetera, you know, isn't going to go anywhere. And eventually a person has to acknowledge. And that's one, that was the first thing is I had to acknowledge that, first of all, that I did something that was wrong. And then I had to accept responsibility. I had to admit that, you know, what I did was wrong and accept the consequences and the responsibilities for what I had done. And, you know, for me is that, of course, that was a very torturous process because, you know, it forces you, it compels you to be honest with yourself, to look at yourself and to escape from blaming others or blaming circumstances because, you know, we have a tendency to always want to look at ourselves in the best possible light. We always want to make a, make ourselves, you know, feel that we are good people. Even if we've done wrong is that we want to look at ourselves and say, well, you know, I'm not such a bad person. And the reason why I did this was because of this or because of that. And a lot of those explanations or reasons that we give ourselves, you know, are sometimes, you know, just things to make ourselves feel better. So it's a, it's a very, you know, t- tough process. But, you know, ultimately is I had to look within myself and, and be honest with myself and, and recognize the reasons and the motives that I did things and, you know, not be deceptive, first of all, with me. And once I was able to take account for those things is that I could work on changing uh, the things that I didn't like about myself. But as long as I evaded or eluded whatever those um, things that I didn't like, whether if it was motives of greed or hatred or anger, as long as I eluded them and didn't accept them or, or confront them head on, is that they continue to, to have a hold on me. So accepting responsibility for what I've done, you know, has been a huge uh, 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 step in the process of me growing as a person and improving and changing, you know, the person that I disliked. Yeah, I think that last statement is really, really powerful. And I think many people can even relate to that, whether they are in the prison system or not focusing on the things we dislike about ourselves, our insecurities, rather than our strengths and the difference that we can make in the world. So what a powerful lesson that is to share based on your experience and your background and what you've been through. On my podcast, I talk to folks about how do we work together to shape a better future. What would be something that you would be personally optimistic about for the future, even though you are on death row and gone through some significant tragedy in life? Yeah, so sure. Um, when you're dealing with the future, for me, is that first of all, is that I I feel like that I have to believe that I have some type of power or control over what the future may be in some way, form, or fashion. I mean, you know, being that I do believe in a law, that I do believe that ultimately he is the possessor of power over all things, and that, you know, I have free will, but, you know, of course, I, I don't believe that I have ultimate free will to change anything that he has already decreed to happen in the future. But nonetheless, is that I do have to feel that I have, based on my free will, my choice, my decision-making, a influence on how things turn out tomorrow. So... I, I became, you know, very, like, in tune with the notion that the decisions that you make today determine your tomorrow. With that idea in mind is that, you know, I realized that it was the decisions that I made in my yesterdays that led me to my present. So if I can now make different decisions, better decisions, good decisions, and particularly decisions that are based on, you know, ideas uh, values, uh, morals that I, you know, want to adhere adhere to, then I believe that the outcome of my tomorrow can be different. Even in the situation where you know I'm on death row, of course, you know I'm I'm on death row based on the decisions that I've made in my yesterdays. That's my present. But I do believe that if I can make decisions now that are different than the self motivated, the uh, you know. Uh, greed-centered or, you know, uh, anger-centered uh, decisions that I've made in the past or decisions that I've made based upon, you know, self-trauma or emotional trauma that I may have, you know, not healed from is that if I can make decisions today that are good, wholesome, pure, righteous decisions that I believe that tomorrow can be a uh, uh, outcome that is you know, good, that is righteous, that is wholesome, that is pure, that is something that I would desire. This current situation that I'm in is only a consequence of the way that I thought and the way that I behaved 
in my yesterday. So I have to believe that, you know, I can change the outcome of tomorrow based on changing my thinking and my actions. Yeah, and I think that's also another powerful message for people to think about is the things that we can do to change our circumstances in the future. We can't do much to change what's already happened. But if we dwell on that or to your earlier point about feeling bad about ourselves and what we have to offer because of our mistakes of the past, we can't move forward and make the changes that might be very impactful to other people in the future or to society. So thank you for your ongoing work right. to help other people. So I think that's that's a really important message. And probably one that people don't unfortunately think about from folks that are in prison or in death row, but the difference that you continue to make yeah. moving forward. So certainly if you are willing to step up and make that difference and shape a better future, there probably isn't stopping anybody else from considering ways that they can do the same. Right. And, and you know, and you mentioned, you know, about feeling bad, you know, I do think that, you know, that, that is a, a prerequisite, you know, initially is that there has to be at least, from experience and in personal experiences, there has to be some sense of stage where if you do something that is wrong, if you did something that is shameful, you did something that is embarrassing, is that it does make you feel bad. And that as a consequence is that it also gives you an opportunity to grow from that and that you have to, you know, experience that bad feeling and know that, you know, this is the part of the accountability. This is the feeling of remorse. This is the feeling of, you know, guilt that accompanies any bad action. However, is that, you know, it's a part of that process and the growth process is that once you grow, go through that bad feeling, that remorseful feeling, is that you get to a point where you can also learn to forgive yourself and heal from whatever trauma or whatever, you know, um, bad or, or crime or sin that you may have committed. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I am going to try something new here, just because I, I thought of it. <laughs> and sometimes I'll try new things. But Tassie, I know you've had an opportunity right. to get to know Aleem uh, very, very well, and as well as the other men that you've worked with on Crimson Letters and beyond. What would be a question that you would ask to Aleem today while he's on the phone with us? Maybe something new that you hadn't thought about asking in the past. Oh, man, I was not expecting that. <laughs> I know. I wasn't either. I just did it. <laughs> So Ali, when I go into the prison, I often see a separation between some people who have been really broken by the prison system and have given up, and some people who've done what you've done and what our other co-authors have done and have used that suffering and that experience as an opportunity to grow and to become better people. What do you think it is that separates the people who are broken from the suffering in prison from the people who use it to grow? Oh, um, well, I definitely, you know, I, I think that the prison system in and of itself is definitely something that breaks people. Um, I've recognized that within myself, you know, is that I've been broken as a consequence of being in prison, um, incarceration, imprisonment, all of the, you know, sur the surrounding physical um, and psychological and emotional uh, effects of being in prison is a, you know, a process people are broken down by it. and you know I, I mean I'm not immune from that you know I'm I'm broken in many aspects and you know in places that I don't know if you know repair is possible as long as I'm in prison um so you know I think as far as what separates people I can't say you know anything because it's definitely not anything that I could say is you know significant about myself that you know distinguishes me from anybody else in prison um, I just think some people, just like some people on the outside of prison, you know, learn how to cope and deal with um, trauma, and they learn the process by which to heal from it. And some people, you know, in the, on the outside, just as some people on the inside, you know, don't want to confront trauma for whatever reasons that it, that they have with inside themselves. Some people do, do things, and they never want to deal with the reality of it, and they may, you know deal in escapism, whether it's drug use or whether it's denial or, you know, uh, a myriad of other things. And that goes on in prison the same way as that I'm, I know that it goes on on the outside. So some people just don't grow and heal in those ways. But, you know, as far as the broken perspective, as I think that probably everybody in here is broken in, in most ways. Yeah, that's powerful. But um, the fact that you were able to kind of take that next step and 
make a difference. And the other the other folks in in prison in death row that are are doing the same is it speaks a lot to your desire to make things better moving forward. I think that that goes a long way. So that was a great question, Tessie. I put you on the spot, but uh, it was a it was a great question and a great answer. So I want to ask both of you um, a question, and each of you can can respond. But um, what would be one call to action that you would give to people out in the world uh, based on the things that you've learned through the Crimson Letters Project as well as just through your experiences with the prison system? I think the most important thing is connection. Um, one reason I think that the prison system exists the way that it, it does and that we put so many people away and forget about them or think that they deserve to be there is because many of us don't personally know anyone in prison. And I think if you, you get to know someone and you make that personal connection, it completely changes your perspective. So I would encourage people to write to someone in prison, to get to know someone in prison, and to really be open to what, um, to what they show you and to the wisdom that they have. And if you'd let me give a really brief plug, I even have a suggestion for how to do that. Sure. <laughs> um, as part of the Crimson Letters book project, because this is a lot more than just a book, uh, this is giving a platform um, to people like Aline so, so that other people can see the wisdom and humility and compassion in him that I see. So as part of the book, we do a free book club um, every Sunday, and uh, you can sign up for the book club on my website, which is www.tessiecastillo.com, and if you join, each week, one of my co-authors calls in. And so you have the opportunity to call, call into a Zoom call, like we're doing now, and to ask personal questions to the co-authors and actually engage in the dialogue. And that's been an incredibly powerful process for the people who participated in it, and it's really shifted their perspective on people in prison. So you get to meet each of the four co-authors of the book individually, a different one each week. And then um, on the final book club, we actually talk about ways that you can get involved in um, changing the prison system. Fantastic. Thank you. So, Aleem, over to you. What would be one call to action you'd want to put out in the world for people? Okay, well, um, you know, as I'm a staunch advocate, advocate, advocate excuse me, of people, you know, on death row that are innocent, which is, you know, a very, you know, very, you know, serious uh, injustice that is occurring. So naturally, I just want to mention, you know, that there are two particular people in, in specific that I want to mention by name, Elrico Fowler, Stacy Tyler. Um, I'm, you know, I'm in a situation where, you know, I know skepticism may be involved. People may, you know, have doubt. People, you know, on the outside ride past this prison virtually every day and would have no clue or no idea that somebody is absolutely innocent and on death row. But I can guarantee, and if, you know, I can say, well, you know, I can talk and talk and talk till my face turns blue, but if, you know, if people would actually go out and, you know, do some research and educate themselves about what is actually going on a person's case, and as I mentioned, El Rico Fowler is a perfect example. He had 10 alibi witnesses that could have testified to his whereabouts on the night in question, but he had a, an attorney that did not do any type of you know, investigation on his case. And he was convicted solely on the testimony of four jailhouse informants and uh, a mistaken uh, witness identification. But, you know, if anyone was able to do any research just on this case alone, is that I'm sure that they would be convinced. And the only thing I can do is that, I, like I said, I feel a moral responsibility. I feel a duty. If I saw on the other side of the wall, uh, you know, a, a helpless, you know, innocent old lady was being attacked, is that I would feel a responsibility to do something, whether it was no more than just yell or wave my arms for someone else to come and help. And in this situation, I may be as helpless as they are, but I feel like the least I can do is wave my arms and just try to get somebody's attention to what's going on. And, you know, the people that may listen to this, they may not have the ability themselves to do anything other than wave their arms and, you know, yell as well. But this is what I encourage and hopefully is that someone on the outside that does have the ability to do something will take an interest into these cases and give them some assistance. So that's what I would ask as a call to action. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Aleem. And I really appreciate the work that you're doing and the passion around it. So their book is Crimson Letters, Voices from Death Row. Tessie Castillo and Aleem, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It takes courage to find humanity in the darkest places. Desi has shown that courage. Below a veil of deep pain, suffering, and anger, she found that it's possible for these men to rise above the darkness to heal, to discover hope and purpose, even though they have been condemned to die. Although this is difficult to discuss, I find it important to clarify why Aleem is on death row. As mentioned, he does take accountability for his crimes. Aleem was initially in prison for the 1993 robbery and first-degree murder of two people. While in prison, he murdered another inmate in 1996, which resulted in his death penalty sentence. These are terrible crimes, and Aleem himself recognizes that. However, as a death row inmate, he had to choose what he would make of the time he had left. As he and Tessie both mentioned, there are many broken people on death row. Some don't choose to make the best of their time left. However, Aleem has chosen to do better, to do something meaningful to him and to others. That is certainly a better option than remaining broken and provides him with a purpose to guide him in a better direction. Regardless of your position on the prison system and the death penalty, exploring these topics allow for tremendously deep and powerful insights on the human condition. It forces us to reflect on the difference between a person's actions, what drives their actions, and who they are as people, at their best and at their worst. So, what lesson can we learn from this? I believe we can learn that with hard work and purpose, we can move beyond our bad decisions, overcome adversity, and strive to do better. We can't change the past, but we can shape a better future for ourselves and for others. So, go on. Go help shape the future. To learn more about the Crimson Letters Project, go to tessiecastillo.com. That's T-E-S-S-I-E-C-A-S. T-I-L-L-O dot com. Make sure to subscribe to Humans Now and Then so you don't miss the rest of Season 3's meaningful conversations. Also, follow Humans Now and Then on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook to continue the conversation. I'm Rebecca Scott, and this has been Humans Now and Then, hosted and produced by Rebecca Scott. Episode notes can be found at humansnowandthen.com. Thank you for listening.